Yeah, we will get started. Today I have the privilege of introducing a leader in the field of conservation biology, so that's very special for me. Professor James Gibbs, he joins us from the Department of Environmental and Forest Biology in Syracuse, Syracuse um, the State University of New York. And Professor Gibbs has a very rich history in conservation-related research and training, having uh, worked as a biologist for the Organization for Tropical Studies, for the Nature Conservancy, for the Wildlife Conservation Society, among others, before joining SUNY in 1997. And he has a remarkable way of integrating across fields to tackle complex questions in conservation biology blending tools like molecular methods and natural history observations and isotopes and a number of other approaches to asking these difficult questions. Um, I also wanted to mention that he has a diversity of projects all over the world and he's going to share his um, experiences in one area with us today, but he's worked on Galapagos tortoise conservation, obviously in the Galapagos Islands. He's worked on uh, the conservation of snow leopards, on uh, local reptile conservation in his area, on vernal pool, rest, uh, vernal pool conservation, and also been involved in capacity building and outreach with his conservation-related activities. And today he's going to be talking about the Galapagos tortoises and how we integrate science and management to address the conservation of this remarkable taxa. So without further ado, I'll uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Gibbs. Well, thank you very much, Laura, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, especially on such a grim day to talk about uh, creatures, fascinating creatures far away, and it's always bright and sunny for the most part. And I do appreciate that introduction because it's exactly what I hope to to present to you today, I'm unabashedly a fairly applied uh, conservation biologist trying to stay as relevant as possible applying science to, the, to, to, to solving problems in conservation. And I have been working with these magnificent creatures in, in these the giant Galapagos tortoises for what's verging on 25 years now um, in a project that um, has evolved in, in, in quirky ways. Um, but through this has been a, a steady interaction between science and management, and, and what I'd like to do with you is just to give you some background on these creatures, but then explore the different ways that, uh, that uh, I think science that originally wasn't necessarily intended to, uh, to play a role in, in conservation of these magnificent creatures, actually end up creating a blueprint for, for moving ahead. So just some quick background on giant tortoises, and I just want to start, this is, uh, uh, where the Galapagos is, uh, off a thousand kilometers off the, the coast of, uh, of uh, Ecuador. Uh, we regard giant tortoises as peculiar uh, biological oddities uh, because they do occur in just two uh, strange places on the planet today. And uh, it's hard to explain why they, just in terms of biogeographic, <coughs> why these two places. Uh, but in fact, giant tortoises aren't at all um, strange and odd creatures in terms of, uh, of ecosystems and, and, uh, and the diversity of life. They were once, and this is usually comes as quite a surprise to a lot of people, they are actually once a very, very common part of our environment. They only now occur in two places, but at, uh, until fairly recently, these are basically the first of the megafauna to, 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 to vanish when people arrive on continents. Um, they are extremely edible, they are extremely um, defenseless. It was just a nice I think, news report a couple of weeks ago about a giant tortoise found in Florida that was all fire scarred with cut marks. They are uh, extremely nutritious animals and, uh, and they're just the first to go. And so what we see today is really a skewed view uh, of, of these creatures. They, they're not at all anomalous, they're not at all unusual. They, uh, until 12,000 years ago, they were widespread on every continent, including these spectacular ones on uh, Australia and the and some of the offline islands with horns and club tails and such. So we really have a skewed view of them. Um, today, they really only occur in something resembling their former magnificence in terms of their diversity. In, in the Galapagos archipelago, they're found in Aldabra Atoll, a single species. But here in Galapagos, we have a rich complement of tortoises that uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly um, how they're organized. Uh, but uh, clearly, at some level, a, a complex of species. 
uh, some parts of the archipelago with some species. But in these many different forms, the classic ones being this, this real rounded, redonda type shape and this extreme saddlebacking, of which this image, I love this image by Frank Soloway, just typifies how, in, in, in a single image, how the, the, the evolution of some of this shell morphology in terms of, for much of the year in Galapagos, the only thing there is to eat are these arboreal tri prickly pears, which have actually evolved to the stature to get away from what that tortoise is doing. But <laughs> the shell and the tortoise has also, in an arms race, uh, modified itself to enable them to reach ever higher. But um, Galapagos, again, unique in having a, 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 com a complex of species, um, somewhat representative uh, of Tortoises around the world, the only actual turtle on the planet with this spectacular saddleback, in here, which uh, exposes, could potentially expose them to a lot of predators which don't exist in Galapagos, so hence these interesting forms. Um, the Galapagos, it's a, um, a relatively young archipelago. I think the oldest islands are about 3.3 million years old, and the youngest, uh, the oldest here on the east and the, old, and, and the youngest on the west has this whole archipelago of slides uh, southeastish, um, but uh, a half a million years or so uh, on this island. We, we don't know where these tortoises come from. We suspect that they're actually from some of those animals I, I just showed, some of the lineages, giant tortoises on the mainland, that actually miniaturized when they got to Galapagos. Um, there's no need for complicated um, explanations of, of colonization of the archipelago. It seems that tortoises arrived um, Within the age of the existing archipelago, and as new islands have formed, they've slowly marched their way over. They basically can't swim, but they float extremely well. Um, they, uh, they, and they've just, as new volcanoes have emerged um, to the west, they've progressively colonized the archipelago, such that on the eastern side, we have some very well differentiated taxa, um, uh, including them to the northern end of Isabella Island here. But, there's clearly a lot of differentiation happening at present in the southern part of here, the most recent volcanoes and the most recent arrivals of tortoises. But this is the complex that, um, that we're dealing with in terms of geography with some notably missing uh, taxa, once present, once abundant, but now, uh, now extinct. Um, <coughs> So just a couple of other words, because this does bear on what I'm discussing, is uh, giant tortoises are interesting animals. They're quite uh, intriguing, but they also, I think, sometimes I think their gigantism and their novelty distracts from what actually are some other important attributes of them. They are important ecosystem engineers. They, they eat a vast amount of vegetation. They're strictly herbivores. They uh, gut passage times in giant tortoises are between 15 and 30 days. During that time, these are some of the only truly migratory reptiles. They, they can move very substantial distances. It's all relative, but uh, even on the, the um, kilometers uh, in that time. They, they move a lot of, uh, they, they do a lot of um, herbivory. They, they have a lot of physical impacts in the environment. They disperse a lot of seeds. And so they, we don't, again, their numbers are so diminished, that, but they, in, in natural densities and in natural sorts of contexts, they, they do these sorts of things in the environment. They, they do heavily engineer them. Um, as you can see here, one of the few really healthy and abundant populations we have this on in Volcan Alcedo. Um, and the last sort of intro point I'd like to make about these creatures is, uh, is well, we find them fascinating biologically, um, but they are also, in a sense, economically incredibly valuable. Galapagos is a major destination, of course, for ecotourism. It's in the hundreds of thousands of people now who visit every year. Um, almost without exception, they have a spectacular experience. And every single visitor survey that starts with, you know, what was the primary reason you came to Galapagos? And everybody answers to see a giant tortoise. There's lots of other reasons for going there, but there's a huge, and this ecotourism machine generates a lot of revenue that actually is critical to the economy of, of Ecuador, the entire republic. So there, there are also uh, a lot of sort of economic dimensions to tortoises that haven't really been explored, but are, but are very important. Uh, restoring them, conserving them isn't just necessarily the right thing to do. It has, it's uh, economically significant as well. So I don't have time to dig into the really tragic human history or history of interaction between humans and tortoises, it, it goes back um, uh, probably 300 years. Um, and uh, this is just a, uh, an interesting photograph of what was once the largest population of giant tortoises 
uh, probably 30 to 50,000, I estimate, on this <coughs> volcano of Sierra uh, Negra on Isabella Island. This is uh, sort of the last tortoises there uh, as they came down to this one temporary water hole hacked to bits for basically the fat on, the on their plastron, the lower part of the shell that was rendered for oil for heating, uh, for the street lamps of Guayaquil Coastal Sea. Um, these, to summarize a, a, a lot of uh, exploration by many historians, it, 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 uh, we're dealing now with uh, the remnants of what was once a, a magnificent uh, a complex of creatures, probably at 10% of its original number. So originally there may have been two to 300,000 giant tortoises milling about on these volcanoes. They're down to 20 to 30,000, which is still a substantial number. Um, and, uh, but uh, much reduced. Originally, the whole, the, the whole sperm whale industry in the Pacific was done on, based on the meat of giant tortoises. The, the whalers would arrive in the Panama Canal at that point from eastern North America, arrive starving in Galapagos three, six months after departing, and they would stock up on giant tortoises in huge numbers. Um, and they would go off to the whaling grounds render the oil, come back to Galapagos a year later, starving, collect more tortoises, and then make the long trip home. Um, I'm going to bring this back later because, to, uh, by and large, this was an utterly destructive force. Um, but curiously, it was also a constructive force insofar as whalers moved some animals around. That have created some interesting opportunities for us. But uh, between um, those depredations and uh, invasive species, which are now largely under control. The Galapagos National Park is extraordinary extermination with their partners of uh, the largest island uh, uh, eradications of rats have just, been, have just succeeded. As, well, it said it could never be done. All of the goats have been removed from this 120 kilometer by um, 60 kilometer uh, um, island. They're incredible advances. Um, and now we're sort of facing a situation where a lot of the, the bleeding has stopped, the, uh, the, the, the species have been rescued from the brink of extinction. How do we sort of rebuild this complex? Because again, tortoises are neat, they're interesting, they're economically important, but they do important things ecologically in the environment. So we convened in 2012 uh, quite an aggregation of folks to think this through, the giant tortoise restoration workshop in Galapagos, a mix of botanists, uh, uh, zoo folks, uh, lots of geneticists, uh, tortoise, turtle and tortoise specialists, of course, park guards and park managers to try and think this through, and generated uh, this initiative um, called the uh, Giant Tortoise Restoration Initiative, uh, which I'm a co-leader, um, to try and start to move things ahead from, from uh, uh, just saving species from extinction to sort of rebuilding numbers back again. And I'd just like to discuss, in the context of this effort, it's very much in progress. We've gotten a lot done, there's a lot of happening, and there'll be a lot too happening shortly, and we're right in the middle of this. But I do, it's been a fascinating um, and uh, somewhat unpredictable um, effort involving some really critical people. Um, the science partner, science management partnership with for, uh, foreign scientists, frankly, and the, and uh, and, uh, and uh, park managers. I just want to highlight Gisela Kakone here from Yale University, who's, I was actually postdoc with Gisela and Jeff at Yale, and it sort of led to this long-term association. Steve Blake and I worked closely on tourist movement uh, ecology issues here, and Joe Flanagan is the vet who oversees a lot of the captive efforts here. But uh, to move all of this ahead, um, and I just want to explore with you the way science has really um, changed the way uh, things have gone and how things are being envisioned for restoring these tortoises. There's a lot of exciting initiatives that, uh, that, uh, um, that are a nice case study in how science can, can influence management and conservation. So basically I'd like to mark, walk you through in sort of a timeline of, uh, of some, some simple case studies and then some more complicated and, and related ones uh, to show you what's happening um, in, in, this, in, in this archipelago to get tortoises back on their feet and perhaps restore them to something resembling their original numbers. Uh, and so just for a very simple example, um, uh, has to do with some of the low-hanging fruit here in terms of uh, uh, how science can really help and inform management. Uh, this is one case of a particular 
population on the central island of Santa Cruz. It's the most heavily populated island in the archipelago. It's been occupied for, oh, 200 plus years. Um, there's about uh, on the order of uh, 30,000 people living here. And um, it's uh, on this island are, are two groups of tortoises, and one is extremely well known. It's the four or five thousand tortoises here moving up and down. This is the agricultural zone on this island. Um, um, a lot of farms, a lot of people. There's a big transportation network. Everybody knows about this uh, this this taxon, and uh, but. Uh, over the years, people had mentioned to us this very uh, this other population that, of course, on the same island, separated just kilometers apart, couldn't couldn't be anything different but just another piece or uh, a lobe of this of this of this well-known taxon. But you might want to check it out because they look different from the other ones. We actually ignored the these were farmers and actually some hunters uh, talking about these serifatel tortoises. For, uh, but they they do have a different uh, shape. Um, uh, they have a different sort of appearance or coloration, and uh, they're extremely low numbers on the other side of this volcano. Um, we were shocked initially to go in and make this trek. Uh, they're in kind of a difficult country down um, into this sort of uh, remoter part of the archipelago where few people go except for hunters. Uh, there's not really many trails, but these are the Serofatel tourists. They do come up into the agricultural zones uh, at certain times of the year. But to uh, actually look at them, uh, genotype them, and, uh, and put them up onto the, the grand phylogeny of tortoises, and to find out that there's no deeper division, really, in the whole archipelago between the known taxa than between these tortoises on the opposite side of this volcano. They've just been lurking back there. There's probably a second colonization of the island. They're tied to their nesting areas, which are opposite sides of the island. It's almost incredible to me that there's not been over um, hundreds of thousands of years, some significant gene flow, but evidently there has not been. And uh, these tortoises are not uh, something to be ignored. Um, in fact, they represent an entirely new species. <coughs> and uh, we have been waiting for years to describe them because we lacked uh, any kind of a holotype, a physical specimen in which to define them. Finally, we found a dead juvenile. You can't obviously go and take a, um, a, 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 a live specimen and uh, and, but we finally found that and, uh, and described this new taxon last year and greatly uh, increased the attention for these animals because, uh, actually I just heard last week the park is taking these into, some of these into captivity to start to build their numbers. They have big problems with burrows, donkeys eating the cactus, um, pigs digging up their nests. But to go from uh, a, uh, unknown to uh, suddenly a major priority, just as a result of uh, some effort and uh, some sequencing has been uh, has been exciting. Uh, but that's sort of an example of some of the simpler, simpler kinds of guidance you can provide as a, as a, as a scientist. Um, it gets a little more complicated when we're trying to deal with um, extinct or purportedly extinct lineages. I'd like to focus right now on, on Santa Fe Island, this little island here, because it's a nice integration of, of issues. And it is uh, one of the smaller islands. It's uh, smaller islands, drier islands. It was probably Whalers actually very early in the early 1800s just basically said in their log books, which they left for, and, uh, and they left notes for one another in certain places. Don't even bother going to Santa Fe, they're all gone. You can still find uh, bits and pieces of tortoises on the island, um, enough to extract DNA from to understand something about uh, their relationships with extant tortoises. But uh, the, these are pieces. Um, uh, that you can still find, uh, and there's reasonably good records that we can, we can assume that there were tortoises there. But uh, it's an interesting island, and but it's lacking these in potentially important ecological agents. And so what do you do in these kinds of situations to, um, not so much for the tortoises' sake, but for the ecosystem's sake to get these animals back? What, how do you move ahead? So we, we cogitated on this for quite some time, <coughs> and there's uh, two, two dimensions to this. One actually physically is an appropriate tortoise for a situation like this. We had an unusual opportunity to, uh, a few years ago to just release some tortoises of these two distinct types, the saddlebacks and the redondas. These were a bunch of tortoises that nobody wanted anymore. They weren't on display. They didn't have money to keep feeding them. They couldn't send them back out of the archipelago, nor could they uh, release them back to their original islands for issues of 
of uh, disease transmission and such. So they were um, uh, all neutered and, uh, and released to this island uh, of Pinta, which has no longer any tortoises on it, to see, uh, to see what would happen. Could you reintroduce tortoises to an island and how would they do? And the remarkable thing with these two morphotypes is that it's probably quite obvious to you, but uh, the one tortoise isn't a simple analog for another. <coughs> Within hours of releasing these animals, the saddleback tortoises went straight down to the lower parts of the island, to the more arid zones where they're better adapted. And the rounded, the redondas, the, the, the uh, dome tortoises went straight up to the top of the island and stayed there for the next uh, couple of years. They're still all out there in this very fixed assortment. But clearly, you have to be very careful about what kinds of tortoises you use to use as analogs for extinct species because even something, I don't know if you think that's dramatic or subtle, but that, that, that saddleback, that, that morphological variation you see there determines uh, tremendously the, where these animals will go and what sorts of impacts they'll have. The other aspect is just simple phylogenetic relationships. And this Santa Fe is in this cluster of islands here that. Uh, that um, were among the first colonized. We don't know if the animals presumably arrived from the continent uh, on this island, San Cristobal. Um, this is a, a suite of islands with closely related tortoises. But Española, is, these three together, um, are possibilities. And mapping the, uh, the, the bones, the remains that we found of Santa Fe tortoises, they map very closely to Española tortoises. And Espanola tortoises turn out also to be quite saddlebacked. So between a dry island with and a, a quite a, a, a phylogenetically close taxon, maybe Espanola would be the appropriate, uh, most appropriate taxon then to use in an analog. So I'm just going to focus on Espanola because it's an interesting story unto itself, and you can't simply go get tortoises and move them around. The question is, if you, how would you do this? Go to another island. Uh, can this island, for example, afford to donate tortoises to restore them to, to an adjacent one? So Española has an incredible history um, and of when the island, when that park was first established in 1959, um, it was uh, well known there were no tortoises left on Española, another low dry island that, that whalers had cleared off early on and said, don't bother going there anymore. The first director actually took a several trips out there and found tortoises. He uh, ended up finding 14 tortoises. They were all on different parts of the island. Um, the backs of many of the uh, tortoises were covered with lichens. They clearly hadn't interacted in decades. They were basically living extinct. And um, they gathered them up one at a time and brought them back. And uh, they got a few additions, or one significant addition from San Diego. This is uh, Diego. And, uh, he flew in uh, from, from San Diego, and he has been a very prolific breeder ever since. Uh, three males and 12 females. But between these, uh, these are all alive and well to this day. So these were collected in 1959, early 60s. Diego came in 72. You can still go see them all. They've produced well over 2,000 offspring now in captivity. And you've got to give folks in Galapagos a huge amount of credit for figuring out how to breed tortoises, uh, many of the world's best zoos on the planet couldn't figure this out, but they, they have done this um, with a remarkable success. And these 2,000 plus now offspring, all the founders are still present. You can see them uh, have gone back to their island. <coughs> and this is from a fairly recent trip, and this was, uh, I think, number 13 of the little tortoises re uh, re uh, reintroduced back in probably 1973. Now these are pretty substantial animals. Um, and. Uh, they are becoming uh, reproductive, and we basically have spent a couple of years sorting through grimy field notes and uh, trying to put together what has happened through several changes in marking systems, um, from machetes to bicycle spoke brands to uh, pit tags, modern pit tags, and piecing this all together. And could um, just to summarize a lot of complicated analyses, this is basically a trajectory since 1975 to the present of total. Total tortoises reintroduced of these repatriates. Uh, these are the, the surviving um, and the, uh, the, the adults, if you will, um, uh, the ones, the reproductives. And this little bump here are the offspring, we call them nativos, or the, the, the intrinsically uh, reproduced. So these are the offspring 
of the original eight repatriates. 30 years later, they're starting to produce their own offspring. So some people would look at this and say, it's terrible, you only got 50% survival. In fact, with endangered species reintroductions, that's amazing to get half of them living. And, but this is really exciting. This, uh, this, uh, this blip here is <coughs> exploding now um, with these are the offspring of the repatriates. And uh, um, as a result of all this, we basically concluded, we did a lot of complicated simulation modeling, population viability analysis. We can easily take tortoises from Espanolo, or we can take the ones that are, that are still being produced in captivity and uh, put them on Santa Fe. And without this insight, uh, the park would not, have, uh, would not have entertained this idea. But in fact, on the basis of it, they almost moved too quickly. They, uh, they, have, uh, they reintroduced just this last May and June um, 201 of these uh, Espanola uh, tortoises to Santa Fe to get tortoises back there doing tortoise things on the island, uh, an island that once had tortoises and now has them again. So they're an analog species, they're presumably an appropriate morphology, and they're out there now, and they seem to be doing quite well. We're very lucky that this coincided with a big El Nino event. Um, so these little tortoises went to a new island <coughs> under optimal conditions. Um, and so that's so far so good. So this is the plan to continue this about 100 juveniles per year for 10 years. And uh, eventually those two will start to mature and, uh, and then uh, sort of take, take the process over and you can step out and let them, let them continue. And so this is the plan and for the next decade we'll see annual releases. Just want to add a point here for scientists that sort of the, the uh, we always wondered about what tortoises do in these ecosystems, and are they actually really important? It's easy to say they're ecosystem engineers, but do they really matter? Um, we have been just finding that uh, for a couple of different aspects, one is digging lots of holes in the Galapagos, which is harder said than done given all the rocks. Um, there's not a lot of soil there. But looking at vegetation history from the soil carbon isotopes all through the, through the soil profile, um, going down with time, about uh, uh, a meter depth gets you about a thousand years. Um, and, uh, and we've found a couple of things that uh, islands that have retained tortoises have actually retained sort of savanna like ecosystems. And islands that have lost their tortoises and had goat infestations uh, have moved very, very strongly to woody vegetation. Um, and if anybody of you are familiar with Galapagos and the arid zones that predominate, uh, you can tell stories about your clothes being shred and just uh, a day in the field coming back scratched up because it's incredibly difficult um, terrain to move through because of the dense woody, woody vegetation. And much of Galapagos is now like this, this seemingly endless thicket of, of, of woody plants except where there's still some disturbance agents like giant tortoises around this cactus, um, but it's, uh, it, it can be quite sobering. We've just begun, we have had, sorry, for three years, these, uh, these exclosures built on three different islands. And visually, you can see uh, some of the, mainly you can see the huge number of cactus pads that are building up inside <coughs> there, cactus fruits, uh, but also the herbaceous vegetation. We've yet to put this together and polish it, but there's striking differences inside and out of these fences where tortoises are excluded. Um, and so uh, we're slowly, better understanding what might be going on here with some complicated interactions in Galapagos between having tortoises once that maintain these, these um, savanna-like ecosystems, um, losing those tortoises through all the depredations of the whalers, uh, bringing in goats which basically preferentially destroy the herbaceous layer, um, and now allowing what little rainfall arrives in Galapagos to actually penetrate to the root systems. Grasses and woody plants have, have well, long-standing competitive relationships, the grass is giving a slight upper hand with uh, intercepting the water before it can get to the roots of the woody plants. But removing that grass layer, enabling this huge incursion of woody plants, um, that uh, even once the goats are removed, it's difficult to introduce tortoises back in. Um, this, I think, is coming together as a, a, a pretty, uh, a lot of evidence is pointing toward that uh, much of this pristine Galapagos that's sold to you in your tourist uh, brochure is maybe a completely novel uh, sort of ecological state. I think the original Galapagos with 300,000 tortoises was probably much more of a mixed grass, woody plant type system. And so it's not, uh, 
There's a lot at stake here. Many other species. This is the waved albatross. It's a species that only nests on Espanola Island, the entire planet. There's a couple of other records from, uh, but uh, it, it, you tie in the fate of tortoises and what they do in ecosystems with the fates of charismatic birds like this. That suddenly tortoise restoration becomes something, something more. And that we found um, has become a very potent argument with a lot of. Uh, we didn't anticipate this, but when you can frame tortoise restoration in the context of, of ecosystem restoration, ecosystem services, uh, the fates of other species. So many people get much more interested in it. So our whole campaign really took off, not by plan or design, but once, once this, uh, this, uh, this uh, larger argument was made for, for restoring them. Something to think about as you, especially the younger scientists, how you pitch, pitch what you do. So just one really quick anecdote, because it is a simple anecdote, but it's, it's uh, Indicative of a, of a larger uh, process, we, we have now gone ahead and released these, uh, these tortoises to Santa Fe Island. They're doing apparently quite well, the 201 released. Um, in the process of scoping out uh, sites to release them, we were surprised on Santa Fe without tortoises to find this, which is a tortoise track. I am about a size 13 feet, and uh, it's a, this clearly was not your typical tortoise. That is a, a massive tortoise footprint. And we spent a remarkable amount of time trying to find what is like basically a Volkswagen. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I think we spent three days trying to track him down, but we finally did find him. And here he is, just a spectacular tortoise. Uh, morphology that doesn't fit this environment in any way. A size, the, the, the arid island tortoises are small and sculpted and um, just without even doing any analyses, clearly something was peculiar here. And we have since genotyped him and found that he wasn't from Santa Fe. Somebody moved him there, um, and who knows why. Um, and he is incredibly uh, well fed. Um, and, uh, but, you know, he has since been removed uh, because we didn't want him paying attention to the smaller tortoises being released because he probably hadn't seen another tortoise for 30 or 40 years. Um, but he was clearly a translocated tortoise. So that is, uh, that is just an anecdote. But the reason I, I want to, I, I mention it is because it's part of a much more interesting phenomenon on Galapagos, which is this pristine system that actually has been <coughs> mucked around with a lot. And the very people who destroyed virtually all of these animals created some interesting opportunities for us to resuscitate them. And in the form of unintended, well, intended for some reason, we don't know, but certainly not in the context of conservation, but translocations of animals to places they didn't belong now have preserved opportunities for us to restore them. So I'm going to just shift now for this second bit of uh, just the Lonesome George story here, um, focused on this island here far in the north. Um, I presume folks maybe heard of Lonesome George. He's a, yeah, a very sad story. Um, Lonesome George just died after 40 years in captivity. He was an old tortoise when he was found in 1972. Here he is. Uh, he was found by an entomologist who uh, was, uh, was exploring Pinta and uh, saw a tortoise, took a picture.